See, I knew you would get bored on Sunday, so I decided to make this video today. And this week we have a brand new Linux tablet, this time from Purism. Although it doesn't look as interesting as the one we talked about previously, especially in the pricing department. We also have the GNOME 45 release candidate, we have HDR gaming on Linux if you run a Steam Deck or Steam OS, and we have the first steps to XFCE's Wayland transition. And we also have this transition to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, and most of you probably already know about it. But if you don't, all you have to remember is that it's your all-in-one solution to build and publish your own website. Even if you don't know anything about how to build a website and you don't know how to code, Squarespace just lets you get started in no time. You pick a template, you drag and drop the various blocks you want, you customize them with the various colors and themes, and you're good to go. And when you want to move forward and enrich your website with a bunch of other features, you can add a video gallery, an online store with online payments, or even a members-only area, and a lot more. And if you need a logo or you need a domain name, Squarespace can also help you with that. So if you need a new website and you don't know how to get started, just click the link in the description below or head over to squarespace.com slash the Linux experiment and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. So on top of the previously announced Surface Pro-like tablet from Star Labs, there's yet another one, this time from Purism, makers of the Librem phone. It's an 11-inch device with Purism Pure OS, a Linux distro based on Debian. The display is 2560 by 1600 running at 60 Hz, and it comes with a very low power Intel N5100, which is a quad-core CPU running at 1.1 GHz, so not a speed demon. It comes with 8 GB of soldered RAM and 1 TB of NVMe storage. It will feature two USB-C ports, a headphone jack, a micro SD card reader, and a fingerprint reader, although it looks like it isn't yet supported under Linux. You will also get Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5, dual cameras, and a keyboard and stylus are also included in the box. And that keyboard doesn't use Bluetooth, it charges off the battery of the device with a hardwired connection. And then there's the price, which will deter a lot of people from even looking at it. 999 US dollars without shipping. If you compare that to the recently announced Starlight Mark V, which has a bigger display with a better resolution, a more recent and more powerful CPU, more RAM and more ports, and it costs $200 less with the full keyboard, pen and tablet bundle, and I'm pretty sure most people would prefer the Star Labs device. Although it is always nice to have more choice, especially in the Linux-powered tablet department where options are very scarce, I think this device has a big pricing problem. At $1,000 for 8 gigs of non-upgradable RAM, a 2.5-year-old CPU, I just don't see the value here. Now, GNOME 45 is now very close. It will release early next week. And so we got a new release candidate with a bunch of last minute changes included in there. You will be able to dismiss notifications by pressing backspace now. And the new activities button has been added as well. You will also be able to switch workspaces by just scrolling over that button. The quick settings menu got some kind of API that lets extensions place buttons in the menu, which is nice. X Wayland support was also improved, three finger swipes on touchscreens should now work more reliably, GNOME software has an improved search feature, GNOME calendar got a redesigned month view with infinite scroll to get to past or future month, and it got a new event editor dialog as well. Nautilus gained its new full height sidebar, the settings were mostly all ported to newer LibAdvita components, the Orca screen reader should perform better and will let you filter redundant descriptions of items on screen, and GNOME Maps gained an experimental vector-based tile set. And a lot more has changed in the release candidate than I was expecting. I really thought GNOME 45 would be a very minor update, but it does look like it's gonna be pretty big. So stay tuned, I'll have a dedicated video about GNOME 45 next week so you can see all the new features and everything that's changed. Now we also have a new release of LibAdvita 1.4, which introduces breakpoints, just like for web pages. 
Developers can specify specific size to change the UI of their apps to better adapt to the screen size. There's also a new navigation view letting developers create stacks of pages in their apps that you can navigate using gestures or back buttons. There's a new split view with a full height sidebar and content panel. And there are a bunch of widgets to make lists of switches, spin buttons, properties, all with a nice unified style. A bunch of components also receive changes to make them look better or handle more use cases. Generally, what this means is that GNOME apps will look better, work better, and be easier to develop. So it's all good. Now, we obviously also have some more Plasma 6 news this week, with more improvements to cursor responsiveness on Wayland and way better latency, especially for games. A bunch of windows that use the menu bar will now better follow the unified header style of KDE for a less heavy look, and the devs have created a new Kirigami component and ported a bunch of lists and grid views throughout Plasma to use that new component as part of the work to better unify the look and feel of the desktop. There were also 119 bugs fixed last week, which is huge. Now, interestingly, Fedora 40 is planning to use Plasma 6 in its KDE spin. This is still a proposal, as Plasma 6 will release in February, and Fedora 40 should be out in April. So depending on the state of Plasma 6, this proposal might be rejected. Now this would also mean deprecating X11 entirely for the KDE spin and moving to Wayland completely. The proposal would also mean dropping support for X11 in all the versions of Plasma as well. So basically Fedora KDE would completely ditch X11. And I think that's the right thing to do. Fedora has always been on the forefront of these new technologies. Plasma 6 said they want to focus exclusively on Wayland or at least favor Wayland extensively in terms of development. So Fedora seems like the right place to give that a shot and completely drop the aging and unsupported X11. But since Plasma 6 is still a few months away, KDE is still getting other updates. KDE 5.27.8 was released this week and it comes with a bunch of nice improvements and fixes. First, the accent color standard is now supported, which means that any app that supports it will look right with the right color in KDE. Hybrid sleep was also improved and Nvidia GPUs can once again be monitored in Plasma System Monitor. Night color will now properly deactivate after resuming from sleep if it was turned off automatically and X11 users also get a better experience with the screenshot app. There was also a fix for multi-monitor setups where the desktop used to crash or really slow down when you regularly disconnected and reconnected external monitors. For Wayland, the window manager should be more robust and has some fixes for alt-tab switching. And there are also some fixes for flatpak apps and SteamOS in Discover. The title bars and the toolbars should now look better on high DPI screens and there were a lot of fixes for various crashes. And of course, it's nothing groundbreaking, but it is still pretty good to see updates to the current version of KDE Plasma while we wait for Plasma 6. And yes, I'm saying we because I moved to KDE a week and a half ago and I've been having a pretty great time with it. Now, if you're an XFCE user, you might want to use Wayland at some point and thankfully the XFCE devs have shared a roadmap for that. Now, don't get too excited, there still isn't a firm date or version for that support to be complete, but the goal is to bring a complete native Wayland experience without needing X Wayland at all. XFCE would use WL Roots as the base for their compositor, which should let them avoid re-implementing everything themselves. In the short term for XFC 4.18, they want to have all their apps working decently under Wayland. But in the long term, they want to drop X settings entirely. And they want to keep the modularity of XFC as well, with the ability to run XF desktop and the XFC panel independently. They're also discussing keeping backwards compatibility with X11 until Nvidia has fully open source drivers. In the current state of things, the XFC panel and the XF desktop don't run under Wayland, although both components already have a completed port waiting to be merged once the various other issues are fixed. A lot of their apps already work natively on Wayland, like the terminal or task manager, but the screenshot tool doesn't yet. The XFC devs have a complete list of the current status of various apps, plugins and components if you want to check on that or if you want to give them a hand. I left a link to it in the video description. 
And it is pretty cool to see XFC moving forward with Wayland. Now, if the Cinnamon, Mate, and Pantheon developers could do the same, it would be great. Come on, guys, don't let XFC beat you to it. Now, in terms of distro news, first we have the release of OpenSUSE Slow Roll, a new variant based on Tumbleweed. It is still a rolling release, but with a slower release schedule than Tumbleweed, with updates every one or two months, and of course security and bug fixes more regularly than that. It's experimental for now, but you can either download an ISO or upgrade to it from Tumbleweed by just replacing the repos. We also have Linux Mint Debian Edition version 6 in beta, a few months after the release of the Ubuntu-based version of Mint. It uses Debian 12 as its base, and it still packs the latest Cinnamon desktop that you might already enjoy in Mint 21.2. You can get that beta from the Mint website right now if you don't like the Ubuntu base, but you like the Mint experience. And speaking of Ubuntu, it looks like 23.10, that will be released next month, will have a full disk encryption option in its installer, using the TPM chips you might have in your devices. If you don't know, a TPM chip stands for Trusted Platform Module, and it's basically just another chip on your motherboard that is used for various security-related features like encryption. The advantage compared to the traditional LUX disk encryption setup is that you don't need to type a passphrase at boot, but it also means that Ubuntu will ship the kernel and bootloader assets as snaps instead of dev packages. It's an interesting approach, probably a bit seamless and maybe even more secure, but tying this with snaps will probably not be very well received. Now the option to use LUX will still be there though, for the time being at least. Okay, so let's finish this with the gaming news. First, we have an update to DXVK NV API, the implementation of the NVIDIA API for DXVK, which comes with support for HDR gaming. Interestingly, this support only works with AMD GPUs for now. If you have the relevant kernel patches, the SteamOS game scope compositor, and the latest version of DXVK NV API. So most people won't be able to use it just yet. Still, it's a good step to enable HDR support for more people, which is going to be awesome, as I do have an HDR TV and I mainly game on my SteamOS console, so I do have game scope and an AMD GPU. Now, Wine 8.16 was also released with the beginnings of the implementation of the Direct Music API, which is a deprecated API, part of older versions of DirectX, but it might still help with supporting older games. There were also 33 bugs fixed, including for Roblox, and a bunch of various non-game specific things are linked to various DLLs. And finally, we have some Steam Deck related news, with the deck and its dock going back on sale, with discounts from 10% from the base model, up to 20% for the most expensive one. We also have the preview build of SteamOS 3.5, with support for color vibrancy and temperature, and the ability to undervolt the Steam Deck's APU to save battery life. HDR can now be enabled on external displays, and variable refresh rate is also supported. The whole Arch Linux base has also been updated, and the KDE Plasma desktop of the desktop mode as well, going to the latest 5.27 version. Graphics drivers also saw an update with fixes for Starfield, and there were a bunch of other smaller things as well. You can move to it using the preview channel in your Steam Deck, if you want to give it a shot. And that's the update I will need to install on my SteamOS console. I just tried it yesterday on Holo ISO and it completely botched my install, so I had to reinstall a newer version of Holo ISO. So maybe I'll wait for the stable release before I really try this out. But you shouldn't wait to try our sponsor out. Tuxedo makes laptops and desktops that ship with Linux pre-installed. They're based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world. And they have a big range of devices with hardware specifically picked because it runs really well under Linux. They also do their own testing, and when they detect that something still has some quirks, they write patches and they submit them upstream so everyone can benefit from these improvements. They have a lot of choices, whether you're looking for a laptop, a NUC, a tower, something for gaming, something for office work, they have it all. All the devices have plenty of customization options for the hardware, for your own logo, for the keyboard layout, and all the laptops can be opened, repaired, and upgraded, including the battery, the RAM, the SSD, and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer, you want to run Linux on it, and you want to support Linux's development, 
Click the link in the description below and get yourself a tuxedo PC. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications or to write a comment. And if you didn't, there's always that dislike button and the comment section to tell me why I suck. And if you really like the channel, there are also plenty of links in the description below to support it. You know how this works. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.